Good morning and welcome. Welcome on behalf of 111111 uh, 11, 11, NGO Federation Vlir UOS in cooperation with Mo or Mondial News. Welcome to the second day of Forward Fest. Allow me to introduce myself at first. Uh, my name is uh, Essel Heweide and I have the pleasure of being your host today. I'm very happy to see so many beautiful people out here today. Um, in this building, we will welcome all different kinds of interesting individuals, people from NGOs, administrations and cabinets, fourth pillar organizations, students, professors, journalists, and the list could go on and on and on. As you can see, we gathered a nice mix of different kinds of people who are all interested in the future of international solidarity. Isn't that a hopeful thing? Maybe we should reflect on that positive thought for a minute. So a round of applause for yourselves. <laughs> Well, you won't be the only ones participating today, because the entire program in this room will be live-streamed for our international contacts worldwide. As you can see, this event itself is also organized with the future in mind. For example, we don't let people fly over from abroad, we just call them in online. The sandwiches that you will order later on today, they are vegan, and we chose for the KVS because they have an international perspective and state of mind. Yesterday was the first day of a Forward Fest, so let's have a closer look at what has been discussed. Therefore, I'd like to invite a few people on this stage who followed yesterday's program very closely. So please welcome them with an applause. Yago Kasoloski, Naima Sherkawi, Tana Dan, and Kifli Woku. Welcome. <laughs> thank you. Hi, and everyone. thank you for joining me on this stage. Um, so yeah, let me kick off by saying um, it's an honor to have you here, and it's a pleasure for Mo to be able to do this. My name is Jahu Kozlowski. I'm the editor-in-chief of Mo magazine, mo.be. Um, yesterday evening online, we had the opportunity for one of our journalists, Peter Stockmans, to interview Peter Pomerantsev, who is one of the leading authors on disinformation, misinformation, and especially specializing on Russia and now in the Ukraine. Um, it was a very interesting conversation, and I'm here to summarize this. It's a bit weird that I'm kicking off because it was the, it was the last event of the day. But there's one phrase that really stuck with me that I think is very interesting for everyone, and it was when, uh, when Peter said during the interview that in a way, it's up to progressive uh, people, progressive organizations, people who put values such as solidarity on the forefront. It is up to them to reinvent the language that they use because we see that reactionary forces have incorporated the language of liberalism, have incorporated the language of capitalism and have incorporated the language of democracy. And he gave a great example, which is that people who, how do I phrase this? Um, People who, who want to get rid of certain people in our country because of the color of their skin or the origin of their country, they don't say it like I'm saying it right now. You know? They take liberal values such as uh, human rights, protection of women, and they use that as an alibi for this. And I thought it was very crucial to kind of take back the narrative and take back these terms and maybe find a new language that isn't corrupted yet. But I'll keep it at that. And uh, yeah, sorry for kicking it off there. <laughs> no, I think, thank you. <laughs> the others are all at ease right now. So uh, thank you very much. Um, who would like to continue? So you can like briefly introduce yourself, tell us which session you followed yesterday and if there are any ideas uh, worth uh, remembering or statements that you've heard yesterday. Well, uh, sir, thank you, and then be me this day, and thank you, audience, and thank you for uh, having me this. My name is Kufli Urku, and I'm a PhD student at Kaleven, and I have a, a attend session yesterday in the afternoon, decolonization, feminism, and climate change. What issues interest me? me? The, the, the panelists were activists and researchers, as well as the feminists, so I have honored to be attend the session, and which uh, broaden my understanding from different spectrums. And what is more interesting for me, what should we decolonize, why decolonize, and how decolonize. Maybe later on I will just, uh, highlight 
on the issues I ha I've had more interested in which issue should be decolonized, why decolonize, and how should be decolonized in order to arrive at the social changes and in international solidarity. What social changes and how international solidarity became at arrive, having in mind the environment. To me, environment is not the ecosystems rather than humans and non-humans environment around the on the planet. So I will be highlight later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. You'd like to continue? Okay. Is that okay, uh, Naima? Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, welcome everyone. My name is Tama Tama Dan, and I've been working for a couple of months now for Triple Eleven as a campaign manager. So, and yesterday afternoon, I had the honor to follow the session, the White Savior Industry Complex. And I must say it was quite interesting. Um, there was a lot of feeding ground for us, uh, for a fruitful debate, and it absolutely invited us to look into the mirror, in the mirror. Uh, we were absolutely challenged to look at ourselves and questionizing ourselves it's, um, as an NGO sector. Um, we talked about White Savior Complex and how dangerous it is for the international communities and how we need to take steps forward to overcome this. But the first insight, and it was absolutely an eye-opener, to be honest, for myself too, is that the definition of White Savior, it doesn't exclusively refer to white people. So uh, they just told us that, no, no, it can include all people, no matter your skin or origin. It's just all the people that aligns with the ideology of white suprem supremacy or whiteness. So that was kind of an interesting insight. Um, and then besides that, we also discussed um, a lot about the term of white savior itself, because uh, we noticed that it includes a kind of accusation towards white people and it made them quite uncomfortable, of course. Um, but it's absolutely necessary and this is also the place, safe space, to feel ourselves uncomfortable. Um, and we also try to find some kind of alternatives for this term, um, such as human saviorism or why couldn't we just simply talk about saviorism? But then there is the risk of acting, yeah, colorblind and neglecting history, if you use this kind of terms. So we concluded more or less that it's important that you just tell the truth and that you realize that you're made of history and that you yeah, need to be conscious about the negative impact of that history. And then finally to conclude, <laughs> Because, yes, there were a lot of um, interesting insights that I would like to share, but that's the theme of No White Savior. They, they absolutely used the sentence that I really liked, and it's about this one. Um, if you work together with international communities, like we all do huh, in our daily work, we should start walking together with the communities. And it means a lot if you have a deeper look into the framework on how your partnerships are built and how you set up projects. So we also concluded that community ownership is key. So we need to reflect on the way we walk in, our attitude that we bring on the table. It should be ethical, it should be conscious, it should be bottom up the way we work and based on equality. And then the most important thing is that it's not about our intention or what, oh, yes, our intention. Um, it's not about us, our sector. It's about the impact that we need to realize on the long term together with those communities. So. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank Naima, you. last but not least. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm uh, Naima Sharkawi. Uh, I also work for Triple Eleven uh, as a direc director of the policy uh, department. Uh, I participated yesterday in two very interesting uh, sessions, one on decolonizing the climate debate and one on can we heal and repair 
international uh, solidarity, both sessions with very interesting speakers, and actually there were a lot of parallels, so I will try to give you the feedback, uh, maybe without mixing it up too much. Uh, so in the uh, session on decolonizing the climate debate, uh, the importance was stressed to have a diverse and inclusive uh, climate movement, engaging young people from diverse backgrounds, and it was recognized that the first steps in de decolonizing the climate movement were being uh, set. It's on the rails, but we'll still have a long way uh, to go. Uh, there are some successes. For example, uh, loss and damage, this principle, is put higher on the agenda thanks to the pressure of climate activists, uh, mostly uh, from what we call, or we, what can be called, uh, the Global South, uh, organizations like MAPA, that's uh, for most affected people and areas, have played a crucial role uh, in there. And I will maybe now take a little jump to the other session where it was uh, very much stressed uh, that in the movement for international solidarity, and I think also for climate justice, uh, which is uh, part of it, uh, it's ver very uh, important not only to have participation of uh, organizations from all the countries in the world, uh, especially for people from people most affected, but to give also, or, or to let the leadership uh, by these uh, organizations and groups, and uh, from this way also question uh, the power relations within our movements uh, self, uh, and, and take a more humble place maybe as organizations uh, from the West. Um, another thing that was said uh, in, the, in the first session was uh, public pressure matters. And I think it's very uh, important to remind us uh, that uh, from time to time it really matters uh, to keep on um, engaging us in public pressure uh, because the policymakers, of course, they know that there is a climate uh, crisis. And we also know now that when necessary, when there is a political will, well, there is money uh, to take measures. So uh, what is really necessary is the political will and to have this uh, public pressure matters on different levels. Of course, we have to engage on the international level, uh, the UN level. It's not perfect, but it's, it's still uh, important, and it's more important to try to make it uh, better uh, rather than to uh, forget about it, but also uh, not expect everything from this international level and engage very much on the national and local levels where in the end these policies have to be implemented and these choices have to be uh, made. Uh, then I go further with the second session, uh, Can We Heal and Repair uh, International Solidarity? And there it was stressed that an approach of reparations um, that it, in only the approach, it also uh, shifts somewhat uh, the power relations be compared to um, a paradigm like aid or assistance. Uh, because uh, if you uh, start from the principle that you have to repair something that you have broken, it's not up to you to determine what the other party has to do with the money uh, you have to pay, uh, for example. So you, you come in another uh, mindset where, for example, the role of local elites, the problems like uh, corruption that may exist and that are important, it's less central to be preoccupied uh, with that uh, from uh, a Western perspective. And you really have to trust uh, on local CSOs, local people, to hold their elites accountable rather than mixing up your uh, responsibility uh, with uh, their role or hiding uh, or evading your responsibility with that as an excuse. Um, what's something that I really also uh, remembered at the, is that reparation in the end, it's not only about money, it's not only about uh, financial reparations, it's in the end about reconstruction of a just world. And that may sound very appealing that because that's what we try to do every day, but it's very important to remind ourselves that this reconstruction of a just world is really a system approach. Uh, we have to really think how to reconstruct the system and we have to be conscious of power relations in the world, but also in our own uh, movement. I also said, I already said the importance of um, the movement being led uh, by the people most affected and we really have to question our own position and realize that 
development organizations can be and have been part of the problem rather than the solution. So our, our challenge is that we have to be more part of the solution than of the problem. And that means that we have a lot of homework to do still, even though we are trying every day, but we still have a lot of homework to do. And in doing this homework, we have to remind ourselves that we don't have to put ourselves in the center. Thank you. Yeah, Zoe, please cut me off because I don't know <laughs> the time. I don't have a clue. I woke up way too early to know what time it is now. I'm so happy to hear from, from three of my co-speakers here the facts about transferring power, transferring uh, means, transferring responsibility. This is a scary thing. I'm the editor-in-chief of Mo. We're doing this process not only towards uh, international journalists and writers all over the world, but we're also doing this and going to set up a program to do this towards young people. This is scary because you're letting go power, you're letting go de de decision making. This is a really scary thing, but I wanted to give an example to emphasize the opportunities that this gives. So recently on Moda.be, we published a, a very large interview about uh, disinformation with a Russian uh, journalist called Olga Yurkova, who basically gives deep insight, great information on this. We decided this information is too valuable to only be published in Dutch and read and reach Flemish readers, Dutch readers across the world. So we decided to translate it into Russian and Ukrainian and publish that on our website. One week later, so the article is read in Russia and Ukraine all over the world. One week later, our website is attacked from a Russian IP address um, in St. Petersburg, which is an accent because that's where their troll factory is. So if the Russians are watching, we, f we found out it was you. It wasn't high on the to-do list, I think, of that agency because it wasn't a very professional attack. But I just want to show that if there's one, one proof of our work having impact, I would say it's, it's the kleptocrats and the people around Putin trying to, to, to silence us. So I just want to give that as, because it's really scary for people in power to do this because in the end, you're still responsible for the freedom that you give to other people and, and the responsibility, also something we should question maybe. Um, but it offers a lot of opportunities to, to do your job, our job, uh, better. Thank you yep. very much. Maybe one you, minute. You said, okay, well, one extra thing, okay, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in relation to the other co-speakers, should be, uh, that were a little highlight, decolonization, one thing should be decolonize neology itself and decolonize legal personality and the justice system itself. Whatever the school of thoughts and theories and feminism, for example, to me it's all about reparation and claiming justice at any point of any moment. For example, it's true that uh, authoritarian and hypocrisy governments should be accountable for war weapons and which deplete the environment, both human and the human environment, and it also causes for damages for uh, the victims, for women and which is uh, the uh, artificially created gorge between men and women. So therefore, the neology should be deconstructed and uh, decolonized first. How, for example, the nature itself should be legal personality for trees, for uh, oceans, for lakes, for rivers, for animals, for mountains should be claimed for legal personality. In issuing legal personality for the environment, the justice should, uh, system should be reformed in order to repatriate the environment, like because of their issued legal personality. If human environment damages the physical and non-physical environment, should be accountable and get the justice in court of in the uh, in front of court that begins with decolonize the neology itself and artificially uh, court between even. In fact, I disagree with the uh, demarcation between global north and global south because there is a neology behind. For example, in the community where I grew up in a very rural and very remote areas, women are the sign of peace and the wisdoms and the wise thinkers, and they have a neology behind difficulties, how to cope up with the environment. They can read the environment, for example, during an early warning system, they can they can wisely and uh, predict what will be happening in the future than men. Therefore, that uh, the source of neology and the, the, the perception should be decolonized. There should be uh, that realized. So policymakers and NGOs and development partners should be take the point for the uh, policy agenda to arrive five piece of SDGs, people, planet, prosperity, and 
and so forth, and to realize that the co-productions and co-design, co-implementation, and co-evaluation system should be arrived. But in order to realize that, there should be a deconstruction and decolonize systems among between different reactors and spectrums on the board. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to conclude now. So uh, thank you for sharing your insights and summarizing uh, yesterday's session. So uh, please uh, give them another round of applause. Yago Kasolowski, Naima Sharkawi, Tamadam, and Kifli Woku.